Hello, today I'm joined by John Davis, CEO of Cordell. Cordell are a UK listed but international technology business with the mission of making railways safer, more efficient and more sustainable. John, many thanks for joining me today. Pleasure. And, and John, can you start by talking about um, the problems that you've identified with your customers, the railway companies, and how your technology solves those problems? Sure. Well, firstly, as you said in your opening, our mission is to create more efficient, safer and more sustainable railroads around the world. And we do that by capturing, storing and analysing data to, to generate meaningful insights for our railroad customers. In terms of consistent issues that we've seen from our customers, I think I'd pick out two. The first one is that in general they have cumbersome and often quite manually generated data which makes it extremely difficult for them to rapidly create meaningful insight from that data. The second is often that is inconsistent and legacy data which is stored in silos rather than something that allows analysis across the entire data set. At Cordell, what we've been able to do is we have a, an agile and automated approach to the capture of the data, the storage of the data, and then critically the analysis of that data, which uses AI to generate those insights and is stored in the cloud to make it easily accessible. That means that we're able to offer genuine use cases which are rail specific to pick off some of the really key problems that our railroad customers face. You know, when you target a new customer, what are the key attributes that you look for in that targeting process? Yes, yeah, so today we have four uh, really fantastic customers across the globe. The first one I'll talk about is ARTC, uh, a really a large Australian railroad. We've had that customer for several years now, and it's been a fantastic place for us to, to really develop our skill sets and develop our capabilities. And the fact that they continue to renew with us and see value in the relationship is very important to us. Secondly, I talk about Network Rail, uh, obviously an, a vastly important player here in the UK market, a huge uh, opportunity for us in terms of the future of that customer relationship. We have a five-year deal in place with them to provide a railroad gauging database, and that's a, a, a vital part of our growth story. The third to mention is Angel Trains, who are a Roscoe over here, a rolling stock company. They're really focused on innovation and how they can differentiate themselves against their competitors. So it's been a fantastic partnership for us and we see lots of opportunity there in the future as well. And finally, but by no means least, we recently signed up Amtrak in the States. That was a, a critical moment for us. It's a six and a half year deal, $6.7 million for that deal. And again, we see great opportunities in terms of how we can evolve that to offer more and more value to Amtrak. You asked about what we target in terms of those customers, and, and truthfully, the customers that benefit from Cordell are those that have legacy data and want to improve the way they inspect and maintain their railroads. And that pretty much means every railroad across the world. Where I think that is particularly important that Cordell can help them best is where that data is siloed, where they have poor consistency across their data, and that's where we can really add most value. And you're on this, 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 this great customer win trajectory. Um, can you talk about how that flow, flows through to the numbers? You know, when you, new, when you win a new customer, you know, what, how does the profitability and the revenue flow through over time as you go through the implementation phase and so on? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And, and what I would say first up is that we only have four meaningful customers for now. So I'm always a bit worried about drawing huge conclusions from a small sample size. But if I talk about Amtrak as an example, the six and a half year contract with, it, with Amtrak has an 18 month uh, setup phase. And actually roughly half of the revenue comes to us in that 18 month period. So there's good margin in there, but of course our cost base as we set up is greater. As we get into the five year period of, of uh, uh, data as a service contract, annual payments, 
then our margin improves considerably. And we have a real uh, positive sense that as we look into FY25 and FY26 for our existing customers, we think 80% margin is definitely achievable. But of course, whilst we're still signing up new ones, that will take time to roll through to the bottom line in, in totality. Great. And can you discuss a little bit the once you're in and with a client and, and, and maybe the, use, the initial use case being clearance, what's the upsell trajectory after that? Yeah, it's a great question. We feel like one of the most exciting things about Cordell's future is that sense of multiple use cases for each individual customer. And as you rightly say, clearances has been often the, the Trojan horse, if you like, or the way we've got into each customer. But um, what we find as we're having conversations with them is they're saying to us, do what you can with this clearance data, show us what you're capable of, and then we're happy to talk about vegetation or ballast profiling or overhead line. And I think that to us feels like an opportunity where you might start with a certain dollar figure per mile that could become 2x or 3x over time, which clearly gives us a chance to, to really grow the business without necessarily growing the customer base hugely. So what factors are, are driving adoption? You know, what is happening in the market to, to drive adoption? And also, in terms of your solution, why, why are customers taking this up now? Yeah, so here I think there are four key things that Cordell brings to its relationship with its customers. The first is that, that sense of a single source of truth, one repository for all the data, allowing us to analyze across those data sets in a way that can generate insight quicker and better. And that leads me to the second, which is about pace. It's partly about uh, the fact that we use AI, but also the fact that we are capturing data on passenger trains, revenue generating trains, which allows us to move quicker. So with our customers today, we're talking about weeks and months for data analysis, whereas they have been looking at quarters and years. And the obvious knock-on effect of that pace is, is typically a cost benefit. So we are able to do things quicker, but also typically cheaper. Again, partly because of the AI analysis rather than human analysis and partly because we are using those passenger trains to, cap to gather the data. And the final piece I'd talk about is, is this, this sustainability piece. So uh, the way inspection and maintenance takes place, of course, is typically by putting boots on ballast. And if we can point the railroad to the specific meters they need to check rather than the section of miles, that's a really significant advantage. And now turning to financials, um, we've just recently reported your H1 results, impressive growth, circa 100% growth. Um, what is driving that? And, and just dropping down the, the, the P&L and balance sheet, can you talk about the, the cash flow and balance sheet? Can, uh, 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 what should investors be looking for from that perspective? Sure, so yeah, we were really delighted with the 100% plus revenue growth. That's been driven firstly by our existing relationships. So Amtrak and Network Rail are both now delivering at the, the levels that the contracts uh, have built into rather than where we were in FY23. Secondly, though, there have been some new gains for us in that first half of financial year 24. Firstly, with Angel Trains, where we've uh, talked about new work we're doing with them around unmanned geometry, around vegeta vegetation analysis, and around overhead line heights and staggers. Beyond that, we've also uh, moved our relationship with Holland LP in the States on further, and we've uh, secured a new contract with them in Mexico, so taking us into Latin America for the first time. Looking forward, uh, and, and thinking about both balance sheet and margins. On the balance sheet side, we're pleased to see our cash at the same levels at the end of FY24, first half as they were at the end of FY23. Uh, we're very confident that we can get to a revenue figure around 4.7 million of revenue in this full financial year, which then I think gives us the chance to be operationally break even. So we see that we have the cash we require. We've invested quite heavily in staff in this first half, but we have the operating expenses in the place we wanted them to be. We have our teams in place in the US, the UK and Australia. So we feel pretty confident on the cash side. And in terms of margin, uh, our margin was lower in this first half, 53% versus our usual 
70% target. That was based on a specific piece of hardware that we needed to source for the unmanned geometry work that we're doing with Angel Trains. That will be a one-off. We won't be seeing that in the second half, and our expectation is that by the end of the financial year, we'll be back to the 70% level. And now then, as you grow the business, um, what, are the key, what are your key priorities? What priorities should investors look for as you look to grow revenues, uh, profitability, and, and build a sustainable business? Yeah, I think the critical thing to look out for is winning more customers. So to date, we obviously have four meaningful customers. Uh, I think we're really looking to double that over the course of the next six to nine months. I think that's a really vital signal to look out for in terms of announcements of new commercial deals that we hope to be able to come to the market with relatively quickly. I think that is likely to be driven in the US. Uh, we've got a lot of very positive conversations happening both with tier one railroads and with tier two railroads. And, and as I say, I'm hoping that certainly by the end of this financial year, we'll have been able to make a couple more announcements. And that's all in service of, of trying to hit that 4.7 million revenue target for the financial year of, of 2024. And translating that into, I guess, what that means uh, financially, financially for the business, um, looking at the PNL, how do you see that evolving as you build these, as you, as you add these new clients on, and, and then maybe how does that drop through to, to cash flow and so on? Yeah. So as we look beyond FY24, we think that a 50% revenue growth year on year is doable. So we'd be looking for something around £7 million of revenue next year. We're pretty confident that that gives us a, a small profit in that year. So definitely operational break even, definitely generating cash in the business, enabling us to invest that cash back into the business to, to keep growing at that 50% level. Beyond FY25, it's looking to whether we can get our business to a 10 million pound revenue. And that feels like something that FY26 should be all about. We expect that growth to, to continue to be driven by the US market. It's just a huge opportunity and we see uh, our pipeline of opportunity there really, really looking very, very positive. But we also would expect to extend beyond the UK into mainland Europe and probably beyond North America into South America, building on our success in, in uh, Mexico. And that will be continuing to focus both on direct-to-customer engagement, but also working with our partners to open up new opportunities. Fascinating stuff. Uh, great to see the business growing internationally. Look forward to seeing what's to, what's, what's to come next. John, many thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Dan.